Gather around, children. Dwayne The Rock Johnson is bringing Christmas early with Red One, a family action film the likes you've never seen before. Mainly because it's such a confusing mess. You have no idea who this movie's actually aimed at. But with a $250 million budget, someone was clearly confident over there. And I have absolutely no idea why. Today, it's time to ruin Christmas by talking about Red One in a spoiler-filled video. <laughs> Hold on to your butts. You're in for a rough ride. Before I regale you with a tale of Christmas shenanigans, if you wouldn't mind hitting the subscribe and the notification bell so these show up in your feed in the future, I would appreciate it. It is free of charge and it, it, was, it would be a really nice Christmas present for myself. Let's talk about Dwayne The Rock Johnson, or as he should be known as, Dwayne The Cole Johnson, because that's the type of present I felt like I got after watching Red One. Joining him is J.K. Simmons, Chris Evans, and Lucy Liu. We have a star-studded cast here. I already talked about it in my actual review, but this is a spoiler video going through the story to the best of my recollection and giving some thoughts along the way. So let's waste no further time and dive right into Red One. The film opens with Jack O'Malley at a Christmas party with his cousins. And we find out right off the bat that Jack O'Malley's a piece of shit. He doesn't give a crap about Christmas. He thinks it's all BS. And he proves it to his fellow cousins by showing them a secret closet that contains all the presents Santa Claus was supposed to deliver. But then one of the adults comes around and says, hey, listen, jackass, these presents are from the parents. Santa comes later. Everyone knows that. Why is Jack so cynical? Why is he such a garbage child? I don't know, but he was born that way, I guess. But I have a feeling that before this film's done, Jack O'Malley's gonna have a change of heart. He's gonna become someone you could see on the nice list. I guess there's, no, is there a nice list? There's just a naughty list. You're either on it or you're not. And you better believe it, Buster, when I tell you he's on the list. <laughs> he's on it big time. Four count naughty lister, four strike. I don't, I don't actually know, it's four something. And I don't want to know what that strike count goes up to. What if you murder someone? What if you do something unspeakable? Does it go up to 10? It's unclear. We, we do get some lore in this movie. There's definitely building. But it's more surface level to lead us into spin-off movies about the Headless Horseman or Bigfoot or the Loch Ness Monster. We'll get to all that in a little bit. But we set the table. We set the stage. And then we're going to jump forward in time. I don't remember how many years, however long it takes Jack to grow up into Chris Evans, who now has a thick New York accent that's going to shift between different accents as the movie goes. <laughs> Sometimes he sounds more natural. Other times he's like, hey, I'm walking here. Forget about it. We are all thrust into the middle of a meet and greet at a local mall where the real Santa Claus, played by J.K. Simmons, is meeting some of the peasants. He likes to get out, get his hands dirty, meet the folks, because that's what it's all about to him. It's about making children happy and parents. He, he doesn't discriminate. He wants, because every parent was once a kid. Santa is a huge name. He's bigger than Taylor Swift. So he needs a bodyguard. He needs a whole outfit to protect him. Enter Calum Drift, AKA Dwayne the Cole Johnson. He is the right hand man to Santa. He makes sure everything is a well oiled machine. He works for the agency ELF, which some confuse with ELF, but no, it's ELF. I don't remember what it stands for. It doesn't matter. It's an acronym. It's bullshit. But Calum takes his job very seriously, comically seriously. Like Dwayne truly believes he's in the Christmas equivalent of an Oppenheimer. The last time I saw Johnson put in this good of a performance, he was a half man, half scorpion CG monstrosity. After Santa takes a couple of requests from the kids to put on the wish list, he heads off to his sleigh, which is really souped up. It's really cool. It's basically what Vin Diesel would roll in if there was a Christmas version of Fast and the Furious. Holy shit, I might have given them the most dangerous idea yet. Could you imagine Fast and the Furious Christmas? Fast and the Furious Xmas? That's what they should have called Fast and the Furious 10. It should have been a Christmas caper. Could you imagine Dom out there with his crew? All right, listen up. All right, sorry. All right, listen up. Krampus and his gang are gonna try to steal the toys from Santa Claus's workshop. Luda's there. Luda, woo! Not on my watch. Let's get to work. The music kicks in. 
Dom hits the NOS on the sleigh. <laughs> Tokyo drifts around the mountainside. And Fuck, I gotta write the script for this. That's all there is to it. All right, let's keep going with whatever we're talking about. Red one. Oh, red one. Convict Gaga. We make our way to the North Pole, which is the saddest looking North Pole I've ever seen in my life. Again, over $200 million budget to see a poorly lit CG disgusting scene of some lights and a lot of industrial complex. I was half tempted to go up to the IMAX screen with some Windex. Nope, it's uh, it's absolutely no clearer than it was before. Amazing. This is a Dwayne the Cole Johnson movie, so of course we have to hit the gym. There has to be a bench pressing scene at some point. Might as well get it out of the sleigh early. Kringle hits the 300 club right out of the gates, and he's going to add more to this thing, getting up to 560, something like that. He's putting a lot of weight on. And we have established through the lore that cookies are not the source of his fat. They're actually the calories he needs because he's burning so many delivering toys. It just makes sense. After a few minutes at the Iron Temple, Caleb informs Santa Claus that uh, he's one day away from retirement. This is it for him. He's hanging up the coat, hanging up the ears. It's time for him to move on to, to bigger and better, whatever that means. What, what else do we even do at the North Pole? What is this giant man? I don't know what he's supposed to be, demigod? Uh, <laughs> at the North Pole, what's he supposed to do with his life? The reason for this is simple. He thinks people are trash. He's not wrong. I'm surprised it took him this long to get there because it's established he's been doing this for hundreds of years. Claus is an actual immortal god, and this is his sole purpose, deliver presents to children. Adds up. But Caleb's like, ho, ho, hold up. I don't need to keep doing this. I'm only going to take part in one last ride. And they actually say that in this film, one last ride. But even though we're in the North Pole, things are about to go south real fast as Callum takes his eyes off the prize and some secret bad guys bust in and steal Santa Claus right from under his nose. Dwayne the Cole Johnson jumps off the side of the tallest building I've ever seen in my life, lands on some slip and slides, and he's trying to chase these dudes down. After several minutes of watching something unfold, it was hard to see because it was so dark, things end with Drift realizing that Claus was not in the vehicle on the ground. He must have been in the one up in the air. <laughs> Played him like a bitch. Time to get Zoe on the horn. Played by Lucy Liu. Zoe works for a secret shadow agency who keeps an eye on all the mythical, magical creatures and things out there, such as... Loch Ness Monster, Bigfoot, Headless Horseman, Santa Claus, Easter Bunny, everything. They have their hands in a lot of different honeypots. So when Zoe finds out that the red one has been Kringle napped, <laughs> she's not happy. And they need to figure out who was responsible for this. All roads point to Jack O'Malley. Jack infiltrated this organization by going to a college campus setting a gazebo on fire, which caused a distraction, headed into some tech department area, put in a little tracker, I don't know what it is, some sort of thing that can read the data, and then he's able to hack into a satellite, which pinpoints disturbances up at the North Pole. I got that maybe 30% correctly, but it doesn't really matter. The whole point here is Jack is good at lying, deceit, and hacking into things. He's a jack of all trades, you could say. <laughs> Subscribe. After getting wired a large sum of cash, he heads back to his apartment only to find out there's a bunch of people waiting for him. And they have these weapons that freeze people on impact. So Jack does a little bit of fighting. Just when he thinks he gets away after busting through a door, running down some stairs, leaping over a side of a ledge. Hi, Jack. Lucy Lou's waiting for him on the other side with a big old peekaboo. It's time to stack them and rack them. They box old Jack up and they take him to an undisclosed location. And this is where he's going to have his eyes wide open as he finds out that not only is Santa Claus real, but a whole lot of other things he chalked up to just fantasy. What really seals the deal is when a giant polar bear from those Coca-Cola commercials comes out and starts yelling at him. 
And the polar bear can talk too, because of course, this movie's stupid. Since Jack is a master tracker and they have less than 24 hours to find Santa Claus before Christmas is canceled, he's gonna have to team up with Calum. And I would assume the rest of the ELF and maybe some government officials are gonna go along for the ride. But I would assume incorrectly, this is a two-man operation. Why? Unclear. Seems like there's a lot of ELF members, there's a lot of government members that could go along, but no, just these two. That's enough. These two are enough for what seems to be a pretty fucking big deal. And I know this movie's not meant to be taken seriously in the slightest, which is confusing because everyone involved in the movie is taking it so damn seriously. <laughs> That's what makes this so funny and awkward to talk about. It's like, why did they go this route? Why is it not more humorous? Why isn't it more playful? Why doesn't it have more of an Austin Powers Zoolander vibe to it? Dwayne the Cole Johnson acts like he's going for an Academy Award here. He's so freaking invested in this performance. All right, now that the plot is securely laid at our feet and the rest of the movie is going to be a globe-trotting affair where our two leads are going to pretend they go to locations which are clearly just sound stages and green screens for the rest of the film. This includes going to a beach that contains only attractive looking women that appear to be AI generated. Uh, wild stuff happening on this beach. It also has three giant snow monstrosities that they have to fight. One is a stupid little bowler hat. Uh, they all have a little bit of their own unique characteristics. This fight scene's not good because we learn of Dwayne the Cole Johnson's fighting style, which is that of Ant-Man. He has a little thing on his wrist. Beep, doo, beep, beep. Makes him go small, shrink down, and then he can pop back up. It's like, psh, honey, I shrunk the kids, and then, psh, honey, I blew up the kid. Remember that chestnut? So we have a fight with the snowman, and Drift is like, <laughs> Meanwhile, Jack O'Malley is also fighting one because he's a human and has no real skill set, as far as I could tell, for fighting, but he's good at it. And he's jumping around, he takes one's face, he puts it on the burner. And this is all gonna lead to the final reveal that they just have to pull the carrots off of their, their nose holes. That makes them melt. After interrogating a couple local slime balls, they realize who the actual villain here is. Grayla, AKA the Christmas Witch. Played by Kiernan Shipka, who is also a teenage witch in Sabrina on Netflix. Not being typecast at all. In order to get to her though, they have to go through Krampus, which will take us to a secret underground dimension. You see, in order to get to these locations in the real world, you just have to go to toy stores and go into the broom closet. Of course, you have to know the code or, or use your amulet or whatever device, and then you just walk through a little blubbery door, and then you're inside. And so to get to Krampus's lair, they go to a cemetery and they head downstairs. And that's where we learn of a Krampus version of slap fighting. This isn't funny, but we're gonna spend a dumb amount of time here. This whole section could really be cut out of the movie and nothing would change. Outside, I guess, of getting to know Krampus a little bit and the lore there, that he is Santa's brother, he's the one responsible for the naughty list. He went all in on the naughty list stuff to the point where Santa had to banish him down below. And Krampus and the Christmas Witch also have a Sam and Diane, will they, won't they thing going on as well. While Drift and O'Malley are down there, Drift says, hey, dumbass, don't touch anything here, okay? This is all, this is all the property of Cramp. Don't Cramp his style, okay? <laughs> Jack doesn't listen. He's basically the monkey from Aladdin. He grabs some gold, puts it in his pocket, saves it for later, and bam, instantly that triggers the alarm, as, as one does. Krampus is not thrilled, but O'Malley convinces him to have a slap fight against Drift. Hilarity ensues, for, for someone maybe. This feat of strength is about on par with Tyson versus Paul. Dwayne The Rock Johnson gets the upper hand when he reaches for one final smack. O'Malley puts his little bracelet thing back on. And he slaps the shit out of Krampus, which Krampus is a god, so it doesn't do much of anything, but it gives them time to flee. After a mediocre fight, they head back upstairs. But they don't get far when they see a piano in an open road and there's a little gift box on top. And this is gonna reveal the true intentions of the Christmas witch. This is an artifact, which looks like a snow globe to be fair. It's called something else, I don't care. But these items are gonna be delivered to all the naughty folks across the globe 
And once they open it, they are sucked inside for all of eternity. Now part of the Christmas Witches collection. This is going to be a problem for Jack because not only has he received one of these globes, but his son has as well. Oh yeah, that's right. He has a son. <laughs> he also has an ex-wife who's the waitress from Always Sunny in Philadelphia. I guess I forgot this little side quest that he goes on. Yeah, he's got, he's not a good dad. He's never there for his son. But when the chips are down and the stakes are high, he's gonna be present. And his son has now been sucked into one of these globes as the first victim. O'Malley, not missing a beat, jumps into his own globe and is now sitting next to his son, imprisoned for presumably all eternity. The end. Uh, no, Calum Drift is going to find a way to save them because it donners upon him that holy shit, I was played like a fool. They never even left the North Pole. Santa was never taken away, which causes him to phone back home and relay the message that the North Pole has been taken. The North Pole has been compromised. Try saying that with a straight face. Dwayne Johnson does the whole time. He realizes that's where they have to be at because the only place where you could manufacture that many globes that quickly. So he heads back there, realizing that the ELF has been taken over by copycats. They're clone creatures in disguise. This movie's got a lot going on. And he's going to fight his way downstairs after freeing Mrs. Claus and some of the other members of his team. And there he's going to see O'Malley and his son already outside of their globes. What? O'Malley evolved as a Pokemon in just a few minutes. He discovered that he's a trash father and he needs to do better. And he promises that he will. And just like that, beep, 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 boop, 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 beep. He's out of his cell. I don't know why his son was ever really imprisoned to begin with. I guess the sins of the father, the sins of the son sort of a situation, but they're both out. Actually, to be fair, O'Malley's kid was kind of trash too. I guess they both learned a lesson along the way. Oh, I said he was going to. Isn't that fun? What a foreshadow. We are now at the final boss of the film. Christmas Witch goes into her true form, which is a giant CGI thing I can barely make out because the last 20 minutes is almost incomprehensible. So hard to see what's happening. Everything is indistinguishable at this point. There's a sleigh ride where the coal jumps on, O'Malley jumps on. Again, O'Malley's human. Somehow he's able to hang on to this fucking thing. He falls off of it at one point, doesn't get a scratch on him. This is Christmas fun for the whole family. Doesn't matter. And just as Grayla is about to body them, in comes her old fling, Krampus. He jumps into the mix, goes down into a hero pose, immediately gets decimated. You know, that's a pet peeve of mine in movies. When they build up a character to be a badass, and then they finally show up and they get into this awesome stoic pose. The music's like, and then they just get taken out right away. Come on, you have one job, build them up and pay it off. After some back and forth song and dance fighting, Chris Kringle, who has been freed from his prison, but incredibly weak, he's drained of his power. He has recovered during the downtime and now he can take on Grela and finish her off once and for all, knocking her over the side of the bridge where she's like, ah! I'll see you in the sequel that we won't get because this movie's bombing. I hate my life. Pfft. Well, they killed the witch, but did they save Christmas? Yeah, they did. They did. Santa trains for this all year long, folks. They get one day off and he's in tip top shape. No, he doesn't missile tiptoe around the house cautiously. This guy is a trained assassin of the highest caliber. He's flipping from rooftop to rooftop, sliding down chimneys, grinding off gutters, <laughs> flipping around through windows. The guy's amazing. Really would have liked to see more of this. This could have been the movie. I would have been all in. It's hard to see still because of the, you know, horse shit lighting, but it was kind of cool. Naturally, Caleb and Jack O'Malley are along for the ride on the sleigh with Jack's kid, baby Jack, little Jack, Jack Jack. And wouldn't you know it, Caleb realized that there is good in people still. After seeing this dirt bag, douche, toilet nozzle pile of ass that is Jack O'Malley able to turn it around? Yeah, there's good in people. He just needed to see it again. And so our heroes fly off into the sunset 
and into the sequel that we won't get because again, this movie's not gonna make its money back. And there you have it, the spoiler breakdown of Red One, a movie that's not ultimately bad. It's just there, it's watchable, it's two hours, it's far too long. It has a very inconsistent tone. The action's not great. It's hard to see what's happening. It's not very funny. It just really is kind of a, a missed opportunity all around. There's some fun ideas, fun concepts, played far too straight, man. I wanna hear from you though. Let me know in the comments below. Did you see Red One? Do you have any desire to, or do you feel like you just watched it and are now complete? I hope so. I hope that that's what I was able to bring to the table. Please think about liking the video and subscribing to the channel. I post reviews, spoiler rants, live streams every single week. Would love to have you stick around and I'll see you next time. Take care.